Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I am Shaza Khan. I'm the Executive Director of the Islamic Schools League of America. And I am so excited to have you all join today's talk, our book talk with Dr. Amber Khan, author of The Islamic Help. You know we always got to do this thing when we've got a book talk. Mashallah, I'm really excited about the talk. I'm super excited about the book. And I'm so excited to see you all after um, a nice long summer, I hope, inshallah. We're all back in session. I pray that you all are keeping healthy and safe and happy. You're taking care of yourselves. A lot of the concepts that we talk about when we're teaching Islamic health to our students are those that we need to incorporate for our own selves. So it's really wonderful to see you all back here. We do have this meeting style because we'd like at the end of the session for you to be able to unmute yourselves and be able to ask questions. We'll maybe use the hand raising hand function but it's just wonderful to see you all here. Until the time for question and answer, I ask you to please make sure that you are on mute, inshallah. You're welcome to um, have your video on or off, inshallah, during the discussion. We'll ask to see as many of your faces as we can. And we are super excited to also let you know about some discount codes to purchase um, Islamic Health if you are interested in it at the end of the session. So we really thank you for making time out on a weekday evening. It's just Monday. I hope you feel like you still have energy for the rest of the day. Um, in the chat, Celsa Beal, um, our executive assistant, will be putting in the web address for the islabookstore.org, which is a website where we hope that you will go ahead and purchase this book and other books if you're interested. Um, your purchases do support ISLA as well, inshallah, when you purchase from there. And we try to also pass along an incentive to you by offering a discount. You'll find a discount code at the top of that website, but I'm gonna be sharing a specific discount code for this book, um, inshallah, midway through the, the talk or maybe before the question and answer. And secondly, if this is your first time hearing about the Islamic Schools League of America, I'd like to just take two more minutes to let you know a little bit about us. We are a nonprofit organization that supports full-time Islamic schools, primarily around the United States, but really we have educators who are connected to us around the, the world, Australia, United Arab Emirates, England, and others. So we're really um, excited to be able to host this network, this professional networking platform. And one of the ways that we do that is through our email listserv. So we invite you to join if you are an Islamic school educator. Um, Sal Sabil will put that into the chat as well. And you can go ahead and click on that. As I am telling you just a few more things about ISLA, please do put introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, we're really a community, a professional community of Islamic school educators. We like to get to know each other. What's your name? What school do you teach at? What do you teach? Where is it located? So four things, your name, what do you teach, where do you teach, and um, what was the fourth one? Maybe maybe also <laughs> uh, what grades do you teach? We'd really love to know a little bit more about you, inshallah. Um, ISLA, in addition to hosting professional networking platform, the IECN, Islamic Educators Communication Network, our email listserv, we also do professional development and we do webinars such as this. We provide resources and um, try and disseminate information. We also engage in research, critical research on Islamic education and share that research with you through multiple platforms, including our website, peer reviewed journals, um, edited book chapters. Inshallah, we hope that it is a benefit to all of our community and that um, we can all continue to appreciate and improve our Islamic schools as we engage in this important work. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the reason why you're here, Sister Amber Khan. Dr. Amber Khan, you are welcome to go ahead and share your screen. I know that that was something you were um, excited to get into. So I'd like to share with you all just a brief biography of Dr. Amber Khan. After graduating from West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, Dr. Amber Khan went on to pursue health education. She's been a Muslim health youth health educator for over 11 years. She teaches health education at schools and community centers, focusing on physical, social, mental, reproductive, and sexual health education. She's also been the chair of the education committee for the Islamic Medical Association of North America, IMANA, for the past four years. Dr. Khan also holds an associate's degree in Islamic studies from Mishka University. She's focused her studies on Aqidah and Dawah, 
She's led many halakas at her local masjid and college universities for the past 10 years, is an educator for new Muslim classes at Muslim Enrichment Project, and a volunteer Muslim chaplain at women correctional facilities. Mashallah, Dr. Khan has written the first health curriculum for Muslim youth called Islamic Health. It's a textbook series with two volumes. Right now, book one is out for ages nine and up, and book two is soon underway for ages 14 and up. The series truly is the first of its kind to tackle the most common health concerns by putting the Islamic way of life at the forefront of its answers and centering the Muslim narrative. I can't tell you guys how excited I am about this book and the fact that it's really, truly grounded in that Islamic worldview. I know that um, we will be ending at the top of the hour. And so I will not take any more time, inshallah, and let Dr. Khan take over. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, wa salam rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, jazakallah khair, and thank you to ISLA and to Dr. Shiza for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. And of course, thank you so much for sharing your Monday evening with me. I know it's been a busy day, so I really appreciate you spending a few minutes uh, this evening so we can talk about uh, what I think, and I believe many of you would agree, is a very important topic. So as Dr. Shazal mentioned, after I went into medical school, I went into health education. And when I started out, I taught health at an Islamic school for several years. I wanted to share with you real questions from some of my middle and high school age students. How do I know when my period is done so I can continue praying? Will wearing a tampon take away my virginity? Since I'm Muslim, am I supposed to hate gay people? Does Islam allow abortion if someone is raped? If I'm touched in a way I don't like, will Allah blame me for being immodest? Is watching pornography haram? I tried alcohol before. Does that make me a bad Muslim? If we can't have boyfriends and girlfriends, then how are we going to get married? I feel sad sometimes. Is something wrong with my faith? These questions with their all-encompassing honesty and maturity, they provide us with insight into the young American Muslim mind. They are Islamic questions, but they were also health-related, and so they were relevant to my class. A typical middle or high school health class, it's commonly called sex education or sex ed. But you know, it's so much more than that. It tackles not just reproductive and sexual health, but physical, social, mental, and even spiritual health. Topics within these areas, they are endless. Puberty, sex, relationships, bullying, self-esteem, body image, drugs and alcohol, diet, exercise, suicide, homosexuality, the list goes on and on. This class, it's vital for all youth, which is why it is considered it is a required course in most American schools. Now, most of the time, health class is taught in ninth grade, and then there's usually a small health session or seminar that middle schools will offer to their fifth or sixth grade class. Elizabeth Nash, she's the senior states issue manager at Guttmacher Institute, and she said, sex education is about life skills. There are so many aspects you take with you for the rest of your life, but you only get it once or twice in school. Health class or sex ed, it's also one of the most controversial classes in the country. There are ongoing debates on what they are permitted to teach, if they need to be medically accurate, age appropriate, if they can be religious and morally bound. And this has led to two major health tracks or curriculums, one of which is the abstinence only health curriculum. This one teaches do not have sex until you are married, but it doesn't explain the why or the how to do that. It also doesn't offer any other health topics. Research has found that an abstinence only health curriculum is ineffective and that it fails to provide children with the proper decision making skills that they need for their health and their overall well being. And then you have the comprehensive health curriculum. This one says abstinence is 100% effective, that it does prevent STDs and unwanted pregnancy. Uh, and it goes into talking about the, high, the how and the why, along with discussing other areas of health like mental and physical health as well. Comprehensive health education, it has been found to reduce the rates of risky behavior amongst American youth. Now, which track is used, it depends on your local school district, it depends on which state you're from, and so it varies from one state to another what their health class looks like. That being said, most health classes are taught following a comprehensive health track, 
Most of them are medically accurate and most of them are age appropriate health content. They are very well done and many Muslim youth are benefiting from this health class. Now, when we talk about high school health class, um, I understand that there are a few Islamic high schools. And so that means that most Muslim youth leaving eighth grade will go into a public school and they will take health class using a public school health textbook. If they end up do going to a high school Islamic school, well, they're also using the local public school's health textbook. So irrespective of a Muslim child going to public or an Islamic school for high school, they're learning from the same curriculum. From my experience, I taught health at an Islamic high school and I used the public school's health textbook and curriculum. I thought the book was very well done and I very much enjoyed using the book, but I did find that it had some issues with it. Two of which are number one, that the secular health textbook, it leaves out integral components of our Islamic way of life. Islam is a religion that strongly believes that religion and science are not at a discourse, that Islam has congruence with all forms of knowledge, especially health. There are many health topics that are discussed in the Quran and the Sunnah, and a great example is actually reproductive and sexual health. They are the two most stigmatized health topics, but subhanAllah, they're also the two most heavily discussed topics in the books of Islamic jurisprudence. For example, these are some of the topics that are mentioned in both Bukhari and Muslim. SubhanAllah, there's no other religion that has provided sexual and reproductive health education, and we don't acknowledge it enough and we don't take advantage of it enough. The Prophet Sallallahu he showed from his example that it's not prohibited to ask questions within these topics. For example, Ali radiallahu an, he asked about nocturnal emissions as well as Umm Sulaim. And then there was even an incident where the Prophet Sallallahu himself would teach about it, such as teaching Umayyah bin Qais radiallahu anha about her monarchy or her first period. So when Muslim youth are only taught about health from a secular source, they lose out on these benefits and the wisdom in the Quran and Sunnah about health. The thick rulings of menstruation, puberty, hygiene, for example, they're absent from the discussion. Sex education with moral boundaries, it won't be considered or valued in a secular health teaching environment. Whereas we would encourage sexual responsibility and self-control, teaching our youth to lower their gaze, to fast as a great action measure, to have good company, to choose friends with good decision-making skills, to avoid sexually explicit content, and of course, to teach them about the physical, social, mental, and spiritual risks of casual relations um, and premarital relations. In addition, secular health education, it prioritizes personal autonomy and self-desire. Now, personal autonomy and body integrity, these are revered in Islam, but also with the understanding that our body is an amana or a trust from Allah. So Islam would emphasize that it's not just about you, but it's also about prioritizing your relationship with a higher being, that he knows what's best for you. We can teach our youth that God's rulings are not meant to burden them or to hold them back, but they're meant to protect them, that they're meant their wisdom is there, that we are to trust Allah's wisdom. Secular health, it also leaves, some, leaves out some of the unique Muslim struggles, such as dealing with Islamophobia and bullying, of not fitting in, of hiding Muslim identity. And this has been found in research by the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding. They reported that Muslim youth are dealing with the same issues as their non-Muslim peers, but they're also dealing with unique issues. And one of the things ISPU recommended was that Islamic institutions, such as Islamic schools, Muslim educators provide our Muslim youth with a learning environment that caters to those needs. Secular health, it also does not address some of the cultural stigmas that are found in some Muslim communities, such as um, the topic of mental health, as well as certain social health issues, such as dealing with racism, especially within the Muslim community, along with the treatment of women. Lastly, is tackling issues like gossiping, anger, envy, or family life issues, such as dealing with grief or coming from a family where the parents are divorced, or there is some type of trauma or abuse. These types of topics would best be discussed within the Islamic teachings of tezkiyah or spiritual purification. So these are aspects of health that would be left out 
when teaching solely from a secular health textbook. But then there are also aspects within the secular health textbook and curriculum that actually contradict Islam entirely that our youth are being taught about. An example is a chapter that I taught, which was about alcohol. And the premise of the chapter was waiting until you are of legal, legal drinking age and how to do that. So we scrapped that entire chapter. And instead, my ninth grade students and I, we talked about the physical, mental, social, and spiritual risks of alcohol consumption, the Islamic wisdom of the stages of its prohibition, how to say no, how to deal with peer pressure, how to answer the question, why don't you drink? how to be confident and proud to live a life of sobriety, finding alternative ways to entertain yourself and hang out with your friends as you get closer to the legal drinking age. If you did drink, finding way or learning how to seek forgiveness from Allah for our mistakes. And for those who are dealing with addiction, we talked about examples of how the Prophet ﷺ compassionately dealt with Muslims during his time who struggled with the Islamic prohibition of alcohol. And lastly, as we talked about Muslim-based resources on those who are dealing with alcohol consumption and uh, addiction. So that was one example of many of how we kind of transformed the book to better fit their needs. Secular health, it also discusses some health topics as social justice issues or American cultural issues, but what we would define as moral issues such as the way that it normalizes, it normalizes um, dating as how you find your spouse or sex outside of marriage as when you're ready or it's based on your sexual freedom. And one topic of particular importance is the way that it promotes embracing whatever identity it is that you choose, such as your sexuality or even your gender. This is a very hot topic for Muslim youth today and many of them have questions and confusions on the Islamic viewpoint. Mubeen Vaid and Wahid Jensen, they wrote a very um, extensive and comprehensive paper. It's actually a two-part paper um, talking about uh, genderism and sexuality in Islam. And at the end of the paper, they mentioned that we are in need of curriculum that caters to the needs of our youth that can actually talk about these topics within the Islamic framework. So these health topics you know, they're what's being discussed in a secular health textbook, but without any Islamic understanding. How does this impact our youth when Islam is left out of the conversation? For some, it may lead youth to support these types of, uh, these types of practices. And for others, they may actually engage in these practices. An example is premarital sex. A 2001 research study by Dr. Samir Ahmed, she's the executive director of FYI, the Family and Youth Institute, and she found that over half of American Muslim college students have already engaged in premarital relations. And in a separate study by Dr. Sobi Ali Faisal, this is a 2014 study, she found that 67% have already engaged in sexual premarital relations, and of those who didn't, 50% of them have considered it. Other risky behaviors include almost half consuming alcohol, 25% with drug use, 37% in tobacco use, 30% in gambling. Secular health teaching, it normalizes these acts and they overshadow the Islamic teachings. So for us to think, you know, our kids are Muslim, the kids go to Islamic school, this is not enough. As Dr. Ahmed, she concluded in her study, there's a false assumption that Muslim kids are protected by their faith and religious practice and are not engaging in premarital sex. We need to be able to answer and address their questions head on so that way we can cater to their needs when they approach a non-Muslim environment and are exposed to these on a daily basis. But there's a much greater issue than just them engaging potentially in sinful behavior. And that is that some Muslim youth are actually starting to doubt and leave Islam because they're thinking Islam doesn't conform. Islam is the one that's intolerant. It doesn't embrace, you know, different identities or what have you that it's, uh, you know, and this is something where it's, it's not just taught in a health class. They're seeing it on a daily basis to them. They're seeing it in the hallways of their high school, uh, what their peers are doing on the weekend, what they're seeing in social media. And then it becomes this desensitization of, 
it's not that big of a deal to have sex or to drink or love is love. You can love whoever you want. Everyone's doing it. It's consequence free. Islam is the one that's backwards. A research study by Pew, this is in 2015, it found that 20% of Muslim youth, they leave Islam by the time they reach adulthood. Muslim youth, they are one of the fastest growing demographics in the United States. 37%, subhanAllah, 37% of American Muslims are under the age of 30. And some of the real issues and challenges that they are going through are strongly related to health topics. Now, maybe we didn't have these discussions when we were young. Our parents didn't talk to us about this and we came out fine. But their circumstance today is not the same as ours. As it's famously said, do not force your children to behave like you, for surely they have been created for a time which is different for your time. Our youth are living at a time when they are literally holding their iman like as if they're holding coal. They are in those times right now. And when we fail to address their needs from Islam, they will turn to secular sources for guidance. And that is exactly what is happening. Dr. Sobia Ali Faisal, she performed a, she did a survey on Muslim youth and she asked them, what's your greatest source of sex education? And the number one answer was media. And then she asked them, what is your least likely source of sex education? And they said, my parents. Islam has real and effective solutions to their questions. We have to give them an outlet to address them. As Dr. Faisal, she said that if the parents are not going to have this conversation, the school systems need to provide this education for them. There is currently no comprehensive health program with Islamic values being taught within Islamic institutions to date. And so from my experience with teaching health in Muslim communities, it was for that reason why I decided to write a textbook series for Muslim youth. It is called Islamic Health, and it aims to address their most common health concerns by putting evidence-based research and the Islamic way of life at the forefront of their answers. The book series has been content edited by Dua Haddad. Um, she is from FYI, she's an educator there, and she's a mental health professional. The fic from the book series comes from Mishke University. I took my courses there as uh, when I was receiving my associate's degree, so they come from Mishke. And the evidence-based research comes from an array of sources, including FYI, ISPU, Yaqeen Institute, and others who, alhamdulillah, have allowed me to use their research as well as their graphics. It is considered to be a comprehensive health textbook, so it includes all of the areas of health. And to ensure that the topics are age appropriate, it needed to be put into two books. The first book called Islamic Health Book One is for ages nine and up, and it is the middle school age book, uh, which is this one here that Dr. Shazab pointed out. And in it, it includes um, eight chapters. Um, I did actually want to stop sharing and I'm going to reshare the PDF. Give me one second. There we go. Can everyone see the PDF? Yes, we this see is it. the great. This is the table of contents that's listed in uh, book one. Uh, within the reproductive and sexual health unit, there are three chapters. The chapter on puberty starts by talking about how Islam prepares Muslim youth for puberty before they've even had puberty. So, uh, by, so yes. interrupt. if you could just, um, can you pull that over a little bit more to, so that we could see the um, left-hand side of that? There we go. Now we see both of the pages. Good. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So the puberty chapter begins by talking about how Islam prepares Muslim youth for puberty before they've even hit puberty. So by age seven, Islam teaches us uh, that parents, uh, that children are to knock on their parents' door at three certain times of the day. And that by age 10, they are to knock at all times and they are to ensure privacy when using the bathroom. And they are also to have their separate bedding. This is to prepare them intellectually, spiritually, as well as physically for now the beginning stages of al-hilm or puberty. The chapter then goes into the physical, mental, and spiritual changes of puberty. Spiritual changes meaning that they are now held accountable and uh, the rulings of modesty. 
The second chapter on reproduction and menstruation talks about the process of reproduction, reproductive anatomy, along with what is menstruation, the cycle products, as, as well as the FIC rulings uh, of menstruation, which come from Ishke University. But in addition, it also tackles some of the cultural stigmas of menstruation, such that a woman who is menstruating is not spiritually impure, but ritually impure as well as the importance that Muslim males are to also understand the rulings of menstruation in Islam, uh, to avoid suspicion or the assumption why they're not seeing a Muslim woman who's not praying or fasting, as well as the discouragement that Muslim women should be taught that they should pretend pray or pretend fast, as this is not an example of Muslim women during the time of the Prophet The final chapter in the Reproductive and Sexual Health Unit for the middle school age is hygiene. This one talks about acne and body odor, some of the common issues that they're going through at that age, but it also talks about certain unique issues such as the fiqh rulings of wudu, ghuzul, and tayammum, when you can perform them, how to perform them, along with nocturnal emissions, and the hadith of five, the five things that are a part of the fitra, such as shaving of uh, the pubic hair, the armpit hair, circumcision, etc. The next unit on healthy living tackles uh, eating, learning to eat in moderation, having a healthy relationship with food, the benefits of intermittent fasting, how um, uh, fitness as well as good sleep and lifestyle diseases can impact one's mental, well, mental health and well-being. The next unit on social health talks firstly about relationship rights, um, the rights between Muslims, which also includes a very special section on advocating for anti-racism, how the Prophet ﷺ was an anti-racist and how he tackled racism and tribalism within his society, and how we are still dealing with those issues today, even within Islamic schools and within our communities. It also talks about the relationship rights between parents and children. And one thing I'd like to note about that is um, for those who may know brother Carl Sharif at Tilghi, he's an educator to youth, particularly on same-sex attraction and gender identity. And in fact, he led an ISLA discussion this summer on that topic. And one of the things that he mentioned that I remembered is that he said, it's so important that we teach our children what a family unit looks like when they are a young age, the role of parents, how a father and a mother complement each other, how a husband and a wife complement each other. So that that way that becomes their framework. And then we can then tackle more sensitive and mature, mature topics of uh, sexual identity and gender identity. Community relationships, um, I'm sorry, and then the last of relationship rights is the rights between non-Muslims, how we are to be tolerant, they have a right towards their religion, the importance of giving da'wah by being an example in our mannerisms. The community relationships chapter talks about that it's not just about me, myself, and I, that there's altruism in Islam. We are to give in charity, help those in poverty, the oppressed, orphans, understand those with disabilities, and even care for the environment. And the last unit, which is on mental health, and just to note, spiritual health is within the entire book. Um, the mental health unit talks about self-esteem, how family and certain familial environments like divorce, abuse, or grief can impact one's self-esteem. It also talks about peers influencing self-esteem as well as body image, using examples from the Sira, such as Abdullah bin Masood, radiallahu an, who didn't fit the stereotypical masculine physique. And in fact, some of the Sahaba kind of poked fun at him and the way that he looked and the Prophet came to his defense and he said, this is the man who killed Abu Jahl. This is the man who, you know, his legs are like the weight of Mount Uhud. Uh, you know, so gives us that understanding of body image from an Islamic framework. And it also introduces mental illness um, as well. The final chapter on entertainment talks about how Islam actually has a very positive view of entertainment. We're not supposed to fast every day or pray all night. We're supposed to take rest, take a break uh, as the, as the you know, Sahaba are an example of engaging in certain sports and enjoying performances during Eid. And so we too are to enjoy entertainment within the bounds of Islam. And this chapter also talks about some of the good and bad with certain entertainment of video games, for example, wasting time, addiction, some of the influences they may have, such as on misogyny, as well as social media. And the chapter also discusses sexually explicit content. I'm going to switch over to an example of a chapter. Uh, this is chapter three, hygiene. These are some of the pages from this chapter.
few things I want to point out. It does include activities within each chapter to have a conversation or a discussion with the class um, on what is being discussed. <clears throat> And just to show you at the end, there is also a chapter review that's found at the end of every chapter that could be either used as a quiz or a test um, or simply a discussion. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to move back to my PowerPoint. And Amber, just want to give you a time check. We're at 730 or central time or halfway through. Perfect. I've got five minutes left, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, book one. Um, has uh, has been endorsed by CISNA, as well as, of course, as ISLA, along with the Family and Youth Institute and Mass as well. Um, now, for those of us who are thinking, well, we don't even have a health class in middle school, so how would we implement this into our school? You don't have a health class, but alhamdulillah, you have, inshallah, an Islamic studies class. And typically, this is the class where these questions tend to be asked. And so one suggestion that I would make, and I of course leave it to your discretion, is you would know much better than I would, is a suggested breakdown of offering a health elective within your Islamic studies class. Um, so for example, for fourth graders, within your Islamic studies class, you spend about two weeks teaching chapter one. And then in their fifth grade Islamic studies class, you spend about a month teaching chapter two and et cetera, as it goes on. So you can slowly implement teaching health within every year um, as they are growing and maturing and as their questions uh, within these different topics tend to arise. I, of course, leave it up to you to make that ultimate decision. So with the maybe two minutes, and the last thing is that on book one is Alhamdulillah, it is now available. It is available at the ISLA bookstore. And uh, when I'm finished, Dr. Shazad can talk to you more about that. Lastly, for the last few minutes, I just wanted to point out uh, book two. Book two is coming out uh, in a couple of weeks, inshallah, it'll be coming out later this year. We're just finaling up, finalizing up the graphics. This is the health textbook. Book two is the health textbook. Book one is a precursor to the book. It is a health book as well. But this is the book where, you know, I imagine it, inshallah, my, with my goal in mind is that this is the ninth grade health textbook for an Islamic school. Uh, this, this book includes 12 chapters. The first chapter, Reproductive Health, is simply a review, as it was discussed in book one. It does discuss a few more mature topics as they are growing. The genderism topic is also reproductive health. It talks about how Allah is the one who chooses our gender, that Islam recognizes not just anatomical differences between males and females, but physiological and dispositional differences as well. That we have examples in our seerah of righteous Muslims who did not fit the norms of gender roles, but were never told to change their gender or to say that they were acting unladylike or they weren't acting like a man. Nusayba bin Kab, she defended the Prophet and he said, wherever I turned, I saw her. He wasn't like, what are you doing out here? This is not where women should be. He didn't have that response. And Hassan ibn Thabit, he was not known for his swordsmanship. He was known for his poetry. And he would use his poetry to defend the Prophet And there were not men who said, this is not how a man should act. They very much revived him for it. In fact, he used to have a, a pulpit next to the Prophet within the Masajid. So this is something in which Islam challenged gender roles 1400 years ago. At the same time, Islam does recognize gender atypical individuals such as intersex. Um, and this chapter talks about that along with Muslims who are personally dealing with gender dysphoria. Sexual health unit is the biggest unit of the um, entire book. Uh, just to point out a few things is the sexual desire and intimacy chapter. This chapter talks about how feeling attracted to another person is a sign of growing up. It's normal, it's expected, it's a part of the way that Allah made us biologically. Some Muslims develop feelings of sexual guilt, but this is cultural, this is not from Islam. Islam has a very positive view of intimacy in marriage. And we, uh, it's looked at as a charity or an act of worship, it's rewardable. But until that point, we are to teach our youth how to control that desire uh, with some of the things that we discussed previously. The sexual identity chapter talks about how Islam recognizes many identities, that being Muslim is our main identity and it serves as an umbrella identity, but we have other identities such as I am a Muslim and a woman or a Muslim and an athlete, for example. But Islam does not recognize identities based on sexual attraction. In Islam, who you find attractive is simply a desire. 
Your feelings are never forbidden, never punishable. So it's not sinful to be attracted toward another person, no matter who they are. But when it comes to engaging in sexual acts, that is what is held accountable. The only permissible sexual acts in Islam are those between the opposite sex who are bound by marriage and engaging in acts permissible under the Sharia. So this chapter talks about the story of Prophet Lut and many of the wisdoms and benefits we can take from that story. It talks about how Muslims may be particularly dealing with same-sex attraction as well as Islamic tolerance towards sexual identities. Then there's sexual violence, pregnancy, the contraception and abortion chapter comes from Alhamdulillah from Yaqeen Institute who allowed me to use their graphics to discuss a very sensitive topic. Intoxicants, as we spoke on, um, there's a social health unit which talks about marriage, comparing dating with Islamic courtship, involving a wali, not being alone, uh, what to look for, looking for character in Islam, talking about Musa alayhi salam and the shepherdess and their engagement story. There's a women's rights and human's rights within social health, which addresses very common questions that non-Muslims ask about women in Islam, like inheritance rights, education, modesty. Then there is the mental health section, which talks about certain stigmas of mental health, uh, mental illness within the Muslim community, such that there's no such thing as mental illness when you're a true Muslim, or you just need to pray or read more Quran. And while spirituality is an aspect of mental illness, mental illness is very much multifactorial and includes possibly hormonal issues, biological issues, unresolved trauma, et cetera. Um, it does, of course, address a very sensitive but much needed topic, which is on suicide and that they were Muslims even during the time of the Prophet ﷺ who struggled with even suicidal thoughts and how he dealt with them compassionately and he did not question their faith or their Islam and offer them advice and support. And the chapter then goes into ways that we can do so as well. And then finally is a unique spiritual health chapter which is called Allah above all else. And this chapter is basically on the nefs and the desires that are within ourselves and how we can better control them, especially being a Muslim in a non-Muslim environment. So this is the book two. And my vision for it is that it would be taught in an Islamic high school in the ninth grade health class for those Muslim youth who do not have an Islamic high school to go to. Then inshallah, this can be a book that <clears throat> their Islamic school can uh, use as a reference to um, share with them that this is something that they, um, that they use as they go into public school. Um, when they do take that public school health class that they can use this to supplement that class at home with their parents. Um, possibly that it could be um, where they opt completely out of taking the public school health class and they take this uh, in place of it. You would know better than I would in terms of the accreditation possibility for that. Um, and then of course, inshallah, that it could also be used at a weekend school or a youth night and being able to address and have these discussions uh, within that environment. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and open it up for questions with the time that we have. I pray inshallah that this serves a need in our community and provides a great benefit. Please forgive me for my shortcomings and my mistakes within the book. I really um, appreciate and welcome your advice uh, and your, um, your questions um, and any of your uh, expertise as well. Jazakallah khair. Uh, and thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, Sister Amber. That's wonderful. I think you provided us with a lot of insight into, um, you know, the book, the topic, why it's so needed. I think, you know, mashallah, we're all very convinced that this is absolutely something that our students need and we need. Um, so a couple of things. Yes, we will be sharing the recording with you all, inshallah. Sister Amber, would you be willing to share the um, PowerPoint with us? Yes, absolutely. I'll send it to you so you can feel free to share it. Inshallah. All right. Alhamdulillah. All right. So we've only got about 20 minutes left. Somebody's asking, um, Amber, before you stop sharing, if you can go back to that slide where you had the breakdown for this book, um, where it starts with fourth grade. I think somebody is looking there uh, for, for, the, for the first book. All right. There we go. Okay. And then um, I invite you all to please uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you've got a question. I think we had someone, Sister Huda Ahmad, please feel free to unmute yourself. And if you're um, camera ready to show your face, we love to get to know one another as well. And please do briefly keep your, keep your questions brief if possible, inshallah, so that we can get as many in as possible. We'll be ending at the top of the hour. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't have my hijab on, so that's why I cannot share my camera, open my camera. So my first uh, question, uh, do you recommend when we're teaching the book, especially with the middle schooler, 
uh, to separate the boys and girls knowing my my school i teach islamic i teach islamic studies and my school is very small so we're they're, they're actually in one class right now so that's the first question and my second question is uh, we're actually in our uh, we live in i live in california and we're actually experiencing right now in our message it uh, that we're having some uh, boys and girls that they are uh, announcing to their uh, friends that they are homosexual and they their parents they are not aware of that because they're afraid that their parents might be um, against that and they're not comfortable sharing that information with their parents so they're actually sharing with their friends and one of my um, students, they have actually shared that with her um, classmate. And to be honest with you, as a teacher, I don't know how to handle that. Story. My first goal is to guide the student, okay? Uh, but I'm afraid to uh, talk to the parents because I'm afraid that the student could get harmed at home. So I would love to hear your opinion. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair, and thank you so much for your questions. To address your first question on separating the genders, uh, within the preface of the book, I mentioned some of my personal recommendations on how to teach the book. I leave it, of course, to your discretion. You know your community, you know your parents, you know the students best. Um, but I did make a, a, a suggestion, which was that it may be best taught within cer certain topics, especially within the reproductive and sexual health unit, that they be taught um, separately. So that way they have the, um, there is the understanding of uh, comfort and, and the ease of being able to ask questions and learn in a comfortable and safe environment. So uh, that is something that uh, I personally would recommend that that being done with um, some of the chapters, yes. Uh, as to your second question, you know, it's something in which, uh, you know, unfortunately we won't have the time and the ability to address, you know, such a grave concern that I'm sure that many of us um, are dealing with, uh, for those of us who are educators and dealing with Muslim youth, that this is not an uncommon question, subhanAllah, this is actually becoming more and more common, uh, which kind of serves the need for, firstly, for ourselves, how do we answer that question for ourselves? Do we understand the Islamic ruling of dealing with same-sex attraction? Do we understand it for ourselves? Um, may we have to take the time to learn about it for ourselves to then be able to not only teach it to another person, but teach it to one who is younger and is being spoon fed, um, you know, this understanding that it is the way that is someone is born, that it's, it's who they are, that it's an identity. Because then when we come at it as, you know, Islam does not allow X, Y, and Z, then they look at it as Islam doesn't embrace who I am, whereas we look at it not as an identity, but simply as a, a, de a desire. And it comes from a place of being able to discuss it with a lot of compassion um, rather than with a harshness of being able to understand this person simply doesn't know. And maybe they are dealing, 100% are dealing with these types of desires, uh, but knowing that it should be dealt with in a compassionate and caring and understanding way. Um, I hope inshallah that it provides you some understanding or some, some comfort in the ability to, to address it inshallah with your student. And please sister, do stay in touch with the ISLA. Um, we have had a few courses and um, professional learning communities where we've, where we've discussed these very um, issues and concerns, very real. And um, we look forward to being a community of professionals who can inshallah respond in the most um, authentic and compassionate way while being true to our um, Islamic guidelines and faith inshallah. Sister Madiha, please. And then sister April. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I think actually you kind of answered my question. Um, I was just going to say that this is an amazing textbook and I look forward to being able to use it inshallah as a grade six teacher or, you know, for whatever grade I'm teaching. But um, I'm wondering if there's a possibility of having, you know, a, a couple of maybe series or courses um, on how to teach the textbook or how to use it effectively, perhaps, because uh, I'd like to feel more prepared, perhaps, or guided um, in that respect. Inshallah, uh, you know, within the preface of the chapter, there is um, the preface in the beginning of the book, it explains how the book is used, how to teach it. And inshallah, that's something that if you, you look at the preface and you have further questions, uh, my contact information is in the back of the book. So you can, of course, feel free to um, 
to contact me. We could do a professional, um, you know, workshop, being able to talk about the book and how to implement it and use it in the classroom, inshallah. Thank you so much, Sister April. Hi, assalamu alaikum. Um, I wanted to um, ask, I actually put it in the chat, but I do girls leadership um, at the middle school level. And I saw how you broke down the chapters. So if I were to get this um, book for our school, um, do I just start from chapter three, which which I think it said chapter three and four was sixth grade. And then, you know, it goes up seventh grade and then eighth grade because uh, two of my classes are, well, one of my classes is combined with seventh and eighth grade. So they're in one leadership class together. And then I have sixth grade by themselves. Um, so like, you know, how would I, how would I teach that just for middle school? Um, or can I start from chapter one? <laughs> That's a great question. The um, suggestion that I had would be with starting with how we wanted to implement it within the school. Now, for those kids who are already in seventh or eighth grade or sixth grade or what have you and did not get the opportunity to learn the chapters prior, uh, would, they would definitely need to start at chapter one. Uh, inshallah, maybe your school perhaps has done a health session or seminar for them on puberty. And so maybe the topic has already been introduced. Uh, and so that way those chapters can be discussed. Uh, perhaps more swiftly, um, but definitely there's questions within that if it hasn't been discussed that could provide some some benefit for them, inshallah. So yes, I would recommend starting from the beginning of the book, uh, irrespective of the grade level, uh, if they have not if they have not had those chapters prior. All right, thank you, Sister Fariha. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so um, my question is about how to go about teaching this in a um, Sunday school format, uh, because our time is limited, um, and we are teaching Islamic studies and Quran in, in a two-hour uh, program. Um, so how would we be able to incorporate this into how, how many hours of instruction would it take? Um, and, uh, and so I wondered if you had some thoughts about that. Um, so if you're referring to book one, for example, book one has eight chapters and the way that I would recommend teaching it within a weekend school, um, you know, if it was a halakha session, it would be uh, one chapter a halakha. So it would be like eight sessions. So if it was taught in a weekend school, for example, then a weekend school is typically a full school year. Um, and so perhaps devoting, um, you know, a month slot or what have you, a month slot or two month slot of teaching, um, you know, those chapters, or you could, um, you know, sprinkle it throughout the year and, you know, within a one hour session, once a month, uh, you teach one of those chapters. And so if the school year is, you know, nine months, one weekend of that month, uh, you have taught one chapter, which may be easier to digest for those children, as well as, you know, learning other things within the weekend program versus just solely health. So I would recommend teaching one chapter a month uh, within a weekend learning class or the weekend learning school. Thank you, that's very helpful, thank you. Great, any other questions that we have? We have 10 minutes left, so Alhamdulillah, we're doing good. Any comments? Um, we have a lot of questions about how to teach. Yes, Bilal, Brother Bilal, perhaps a teaching program to support implementation. Sister and Amber and I, Sister Amber and I can definitely talk offline, inshallah, and see about that. And as she's mentioned, there is a contact, um, uh, her contact info in the book as well. So um, I would be happy to support that if Dr. Um, Amber is also interested, inshallah. There you go. There's her email in the chat. Alhamdulillah. My email is Islamic Health Education at Gmail. Um, also, you can follow me on Instagram as well, Islamic Health Series, to get updates um, on the books, particularly with book two, which is going to be coming out soon, inshallah. You know, I just want to throw out there that one of the things that we love to do at ISLA is have professional learning communities and um, where, you know, it's not prescriptive necessarily, but we are the experts in some way, right? Alhamdulillah, we are teachers and um, teaching is something that, you know, requires specificity, cultural relevance to our students. And we know them best, alhamdulillah. There's definitely a lot we can learn from each other. So we do invite you to be part of our email listserv, inshallah. So El Sabil can throw out that um, link again, where you can join our email listserv. And we've also joined 
a platform called VPeer. Some of you have found it to be really nice and some have had some issues with the technology. So Inshallah, we're working on all that together, but you know, it's really important for us to stay connected and to have confidence Inshallah in the way that um, we have been trained in our experience and our training as teachers and Inshallah, um, we can learn a lot from one another as well. And yeah, Sister Quran, so I want to go, of course, please. And if you're speaking, you're muted. Wa alaikum as Alhamdulillah. I am just so elated. I'm about to jump through the ceiling with joy and I'm doing the happy dance because this is so much needed. And, you know, I kept putting it on my to-do list year after year, like you've got to do something that's comprehensive. And mashallah, the angels heard the dua and you answered it. So thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done. And I know that our students will benefit because they need to be connected in the way that you are sharing this. And I just love the fact that it comes from the perspective of Quran, what Allah says more than anything. So thank you so much. And may Allah reward and bless you and may his angels surround you and uplift you and elevate you over and over again. And thank you. Isla oh. for doing this. We are so grateful. Can you hear my joy? I hear it, Quran. I feel it. Forget <laughs> hear it. I feel it. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I mean, Jazakallah khair, Quran. I really appreciate that, especially coming from you. I listened to your Isna talk as well a few weeks back when Dr. Shazal presented as well. So it means a lot coming from you. I appreciate that. Jazak. Thank you so much. I have a um, kind of an anonymous question, it seems, since it's a direct message. Um, so, Sir Amber, I think one of the things that we often wonder about is like, at what age are our students or our children mature enough to um, have, it, she says, is an 11 year old mature female, but that has not yet hit puberty ready for the talk. And I don't know if they mean by the talk, do they mean, um, you know, sexual, um, re reproductive health kind of talk, the birds and the bees talk, or, and how much of the talk should I get into is their question. So, you know, and then, and then I, I'll just take it out a little bit further to the Islamic school, especially having taught sixth grade Islamic studies myself, you have students who are very mature, even I'm not talking about physically, but I'm just like mentally ready to take things. And, and I know in your preface, I was really impressed, you know, by setting that tone, you say you really need to set that tone of like, Look, we're going to be talking about some serious topics, so I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit more about that. But somebody's asking specifically, like about an eleven-year-old who has had puberty, and then if you could bring it back out to the classroom. That's a great question. In the book one, which is a precursor to book two, book one does not talk about sex. Actually, it's not discussed in the book. Um, it is only discussed from an anatomical perspective when we go through the chapter called reproductive, reproduction and menstruation, which is in chapter two. And in that chapter, it talks about uh, what menstruation is, the purpose of menstruation, which is um, that it very much aligns with pregnancy. And so if one does not understand that a sperm and an egg align to make a to make a baby, uh, then the understanding of menstruation is really impossible to understand. But in terms of how the sperm and the egg come together um, and that process in terms of intimacy, it is not discussed in book one intentionally. Picture it here. Um, yeah, um, so it's talked about in an anatomical perspective. Um, the discussion in regards to a girl who is 11, for example, who has not yet hit puberty, um, I would refer back to the Sunnah of the Prophet when we talk about Umar bin Qais. Um, when she was sitting on the back of the camel of the Prophet salam, she had some uh, fluid emitting from her and it, um, it stained the suitcases that were on his camel. And it was in that moment where she had her first period. She was very well aware of what was happening. She knew what it was. In other words, she was already taught about her period before she had her period. Versus in our community, we hear stories about a girl waking up in the middle of the night and she sees blood on her bed. And one sister told me, who is now an adult, she said, I thought I was dying. I thought I had a disease. She didn't, she was not informed. She had no understanding that this was going to happen to her and that this is natural and normal and biological versus go back 1400 years and Umar bin Qais is sitting on the camel and thinking, oh, my period, that's what this is. And then you have the Prophet Salam turning to her and saying, um, this is how you clean it and this is what you do and et cetera, et cetera. So we have to prepare our youth before it happens, not mm -hmm. after the fact. So that way they know, and it's not something in which 
And it's also something which is um, talked about in a very special way. This is something that's amazing that's going to happen to you. This is a sign of becoming a woman, the kind of, the kind of, of becoming a man. This is something in which um, you know, is something to look forward to and something, inshallah, that uh, should be celebrated. And just to end on that with Umayyad bin Qais is that the day that she got her monarchy, they were collecting booty after the war and he gave her a necklace to celebrate her monarchy. And she said she wore it for the rest of her life. And she even was asked uh, that it be buried with her. So look at this positive view that she has of what happened to her versus subhanAllah, some of the stories that you know, maybe some of us had or people that we know of who have a very, think uh, uh, that it was very confusing time for them or, you know, even a traumatic moment for them. This is something that this is, this is of our sunnah. This is, this is the way in which we, you know, want our children to be raised in that way. So inshallah, that, that is something in which keep in mind uh, with that. But again, book one does not discuss the topic of sex in that that is something that we have reserved for book two, which is in chapter two on sexual desire. SubhanAllah, Amber, I really appreciate that um, you bring that piece back to um, our classrooms, to, to, to Muslim educators and to our Muslim youth, inshallah, the piece about not stigmatizing um, the beauty of our biology, the way that Allah has created us, and that then transfers over to the way that we then approach um, sexual health and, and you know, desires and, and and these things as well. Whereas I think, you know, maybe out of good intentions um, and, and this effort to try and like combat the hypersexualization of our society, there has been a lot of stigmatization and um, of, of, of desire even. And that has really impacted a lot of um, young people as well as adults in their relationships too. So just kind of like a side comment that I wanted to yeah. make. I had One thing that I will, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Go ahead, Shaza. I just wanted to get to a couple of quick questions, Sister Amber, that I've seen posted here in the chat. One was that um, somebody asked about the FIC, which, which um, school of FIC um, are you using? And the other one, sister is asking about, is there like a letter to a draft, a waiver letter included for parents? Mm. Um, or is that left to the school? So I know that you introduced that, but I'll let you talk about that. Uh, the FIC is comparative FIC. So it does not follow in Hanafi Madhab or what it discusses all four, um, as well as it discusses the, um, the strongest opinion. And so we leave that to the discretion of telling the child. Uh, and just to note that the book is given in the U format or the U pronoun, it's talking to the child. It's not talking to the teacher. It's not talking to the parent. The book is written to the child for the child. Um, and so in that it talks about, these are the different views and different opinions, for example, the fic of menstruation or the fic of hygiene. Um, and then please talk to a religious scholar to learn more. Please talk to your parents to learn more. Um, so it doesn't uh, lean one way or another. In regards to a waiver, alhamdulillah, that's a wonderful question because I highly recommend that the parents are very much a part of the discussion and that they first are aware and know uh, what is being discussed and that this is something that the school wants being discussed and this is something that the students are wanting to be discussed to them as well. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned in the preface is that you hold either a parents night or a zoom session um, or one of the things that I did when I taught ninth grade health was that I sent home a note to the parents and when I met them at the parent teacher conference I sat with them in person and I said these are the things that we are going to discuss in class. Are you comfortable with this? Would you allow us to discuss this? Um, and had them sign um, a waiver. So I did that exact same thing. And I think that's a very important thing to do um, to ensure that the parents are involved and just to, as a protection from yourselves as an educator standpoint. Um, it's also important, one of the things I wanted to mention uh, when uh, Shazaw was talking about, um, talking about this and hypersexualization of the society that we live in, is that we can discuss these topics with Haya. We can discuss them uh, in a way in which we give them the information that they need, but Haya is implemented within the classroom. Uh, an example is when the Prophet ﷺ would talk about uh, private organs. He referred to them as private organs and that there's a time and a place to um, use the medical terms, um, but graphics or things like this or, or terminology and words, uh, Haya is something that can be implemented and should be implemented in the environment as well. 
Sister Amber, if we have any more questions um, coming in, we invite folks to go ahead and email us. I do see something that Sister Hanan has asked. It's very important. So inshallah, I'll share that with you. And um, Sister Amber, I invite you to again, put your email address if you're um, well, if you are okay with folks emailing you directly. So we um, will invite you to do that, but inshallah, we will at least take them over here at ISLA as well, if you're interested in, um, we can provide you with a group email with a consolidation of all of those questions, inshallah, you can um, try to tackle those as your availability permits. Jazakum al-khairan to you all for doing what you do, for being concerned, for caring about teaching our youth, our children about um, Islamic health. Thank you so much, Dr. Amber. Um, Jazakum al-khairan for the many years of um, work that you've put into to creating this. And may Allah reward you and grant you tawfiq in, in continuing along this journey, inshallah. And um, again, thank you all so much for being here, for giving us some of your evening. Jazakum al and Salsa Beal for helping us out. And um, we take it, we ask you all to please take care of yourselves and to take care of your health as well. That is very important, your mental, physical, spiritual health, inshallah. And um, we hope to see you again at another book talk or speaker series soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad.